External GPUs can be a messy business. I've hacked together enough rat's nests of PSU cables and janky adapters that I've come to appreciate a nice, tidy, integrated eGPU. Like this one from Morphine, featuring a powerful Ada Lovelace GPU with 12GB of VRAM in a tiny package. It comes with interchangeable Thunderbolt 4 and Oculink connectors, and with RTX 40 series performance, including ray tracing and DLSS, it could be the solution to your portable gaming needs. Yeah, I stress the words, could be. The Morphine G1 is available in a couple of options. The full fat 16GB model priced at £1046 at current exchange rates, and this cut down 12GB model priced at £764. Unlike the DIY solutions I've put together in the past, these are not desktop GPUs but mobile ones. Nvidia calls them the RTX 4090M and 4080M respectively, However, this in no way lines up with the desktop cards that bear these names and shouldn't colour your expectations. The 4090M has 9728 shaders, about 40% less than the real 4090 and with 8GB less VRAM. This 4080 is closer to a 4070 Ti, which of course was originally intended to be the 12GB 4080 before Hardware Unboxed bullied Nvidia into changing their mind. It is still a mobile GPU, so it's somewhat lower clocked and with a lower TDP than you'd expect from a full-size desktop graphics card, but it's also absolutely tiny. Some mini PCs are actually bigger than this thing, though that is partly thanks to the external power brick. The small size does have cooling implications. The setup Morphine have developed actually seems to be fairly effective with adjustable fan profiles via a button press but it can sound like a small hairdryer under gaming loads. Being a mobile GeForce GPU also brings with it some other problems, which I'll come back to later in the video, but uh, which might be a red flag. I'm testing the Morphine G1 4080M with a GMK Tech Evo T1, which is an Intel Ultra 9 powered mini PC with both Oculink and Thunderbolt 4 connectors. Oculink is far less universal than Thunderbolt, but in theory it's superior in performance, and many devices can be hacked into using it, sometimes literally, as you might need to cut a hole for the cable to pass through. Still, as Thunderbolt is far more common, I tested both, and as it turns out, which standard you choose very much affects whether or not you should buy it. Starting relatively unproblematically with The Last of Us Part 2. This game isn't too hard for this class of GPU to run, and 12GB is absolutely enough for even this quite memory intensive console port. When connected over Oculink, performance is very much in line with what you might expect. It's in the ballpark of a desktop 5060 Ti, averaging above 60 at both 1080p and 1440p, and if you can stomach a locked 30 FPS, you can push it to 4K without DLSS. Swapping the Oculink and Thunderbolt modules is just the work of a few moments with the supplied hex key and a small Phillips screwdriver, and the result is an absolute faceplant by the 4080M. Seriously, it's like I performed a lobotomy on it. At 1080p, performance is halved. At 1440p, it's lost about 45% and about a third at 4K. FYI, I double checked the results, rebooted the PC and the integrated graphics were disabled for both Oculink and Thunderbolt tests. Nothing else was plugged in over Thunderbolt either, so honestly, I don't know where all the performance went. But it's not going to be the last time, or even the worst. My Spider-Man 2 benchmark run is a quick thwip along Broadway, and it generally produces a frame time graph that looks something like a 6 month overview of the price of Bitcoin, even on a fairly high end setup. In my Oculink tests, that's about what I got. 1080p is playable at a 60 plus average, while 1440p and 4K could probably benefit from some DLSS. 
I added some DLSS Q to my ray tracing benchmarks, but this didn't help produce a 60 plus average at any resolution. This is actually quite a bit worse than a 5060 Ti, but that's not the biggest problem here. That's what happens when you plug in the G1 over Thunderbolt. The game gets absolutely torn to shreds. At 1080p and 1440p, there's some kind of bottleneck, meaning that neither run is different from the other, but that means both are averaging in the mid 20s and 1% lows are around 10 FPS. 4K actually takes a remarkably small drop compared to 1440p, but it's still only running at 20 FPS on average. Yeah, I know I could drop settings and get a higher frame rate, but that's not the point. The only difference between this and a playable experience is the port it's plugged into. After that bombshell, let's move on to a couple of lighter weight titles. Kingdom Come 2 glides along on the Oculink setup, remaining a solid 60 plus even at 1440p. 4K is a little disappointing and you definitely want to turn on some DLSS at this point, but I'd still call it a good experience. Over Thunderbolt there's a smaller bottleneck than the last two tests, but it's still substantial. At 1080p we're now below 60fps, at 1440 it's below the 50 mark, and 4K hovers around 30. All of this is fixable with DLSS, but it's still a big waste of this GPU's potential performance. I thought stepping back a generation with Forza Horizon 5 might be doing the Thunderbolt port a favour, but honestly, it's really not. Over Oculink, the 4080M is handling the game like a dream. At 1080p and 1440p, completely maxed out with Extreme RT enabled, we're in high refresh rate territory. And your CPU might actually be a bottleneck if you have anything less potent than the 285H. So far, so good, but switching over to Thunderbolt absolutely destroys it. You might not notice at first glance, as the averages are lower but not game-breakingly so, but the 1% lows tell the story. The game literally slows down every few seconds for no good reason that I could see. Even turning settings down didn't help. Unreal Engine 5 games generally need something of this potency to get a good gaming experience at epic settings, and honestly, I might have been pushing it. At native 1080p, we're just short of 60fps over Oculink, and at 4K, things are pretty much unplayable. Rather than drop settings, I added some quality DLSS, which pushed the 1080p average up to the 70s, 1440p approaches a 60 average, and even 4K is now in the 30s. Thunderbolt, however, doesn't do anywhere nearly as well. Even with DLSS, 1080p falls short of 60, and while 4K is passing 30, I'm seeing some of that same weird slowdown as I experienced in Forza, though it doesn't seem to be affecting the frame time graph for some reason. Unfortunately, 12GB of VRAM isn't enough to really max out Indiana Jones, so to get things playable at 1080p and 1440p, I had to drop to the very ultra presets. <sighs> you can't have both ultra and very ultra. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to have extreme higher than ultra in the Forza settings menu either, but very ultra is grammatically wrong, and it's still not the highest setting. <clears throat> at 1080p, the game glides along at 90 plus on average and over 70 FPS at 1440p. 4K caused the game to crash, so you'd need to drop settings pretty far and probably add some upscaling to get things playable. That's with Oculink anyway, with Thunderbolt performances once more cut almost in half, to the point where you'd need DLSS to get to 1080p 60. Finally, I wanted to round out the benchmarks with that perennial favourite of benchmarkers, Cyberpunk 2077. For once, the biggest bottleneck here was actually the Intel CPU. Perhaps a Ryzen would have done better, but in testing, the 1080p and 1440p numbers are a dead heat. Both are quite playable too, and while some would argue you could tolerate a 4K 30fps experience, I'd be inclined to add some DLSS to get into the 40s. I'd like to have some Thunderbolt results for comparison, 
except my cyberpunk installation got corrupted and I didn't have time to install it again. Seriously, this video was supposed to have come out last Friday. I knew that Thunderbolt would be slower than Oculink, but I didn't expect this big of a difference. If you can use Oculink, the G1 is a perfectly decent performer. Perhaps not as good as the highfalutin model number would suggest, but better than you'd get from pretty much any integrated graphics out there right now. On the other hand, if you can only connect via Thunderbolt, you might want to think twice. Maybe there's a use case that involves productivity or AI, but if you want to use the G1 for boosting your frame rates and quality settings, or turning on ray tracing, then you should probably look into adding an Oculink port before investing in any eGPU. And that's not the only issue. I mentioned earlier that there were problems associated with using a mobile GeForce GPU like this. Specifically, the problem is that Nvidia really don't want you to, so the G1 can't actually use the official Nvidia drivers. Morphine do have a driver package you can use, but they've been modded to work by Morphine themselves, which raises a few red flags. Even if we trust Morphine implicitly not to use their driver package for evil, having to rely on Morphine for updates means we don't get them as frequently as we might like. The version hosted at the time of recording was already a couple of months old, and while Morphine did suggest that the Nvidia app would allow for driver updates, that wasn't the case for me. If for whatever reason you're unable to get the drivers you need from Morphine, that means you're looking at other third party options, like the Franken drivers I've used with the modded 4090M and 3080Ti-M in the past, and not only do they pose similar risks to the Morphine version, they also cost money. Not a lot of money, granted, but still. The limited Thunderbolt performance and the reliance on unofficial drivers makes the G1 an incredibly niche product. If it weren't for the driver thing, and the Thunderbolt thing, this would be easier to recommend. It's an expensive product, but not obscenely expensive, and if you can justify spending all that money on a high performance mini PC, you can probably justify 800 quid to add 5060 Ti like performance to it. However, until Jensen is visited in the night by the ghosts of gaming future, forcing him to see the error of his ways and stop blocking these devices from accessing the official drivers, I'm wary about recommending the G1 unreservedly. Thanks to Morfine for supplying the review unit, thanks to you for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.